Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's session, How One Country Sought to Combat the Harm of Burning Sugarcane. My name is Rocio Ortega, and I'm the Events Associate at ProPublica, and I'll be your host today. Today, we'll be testing out a couple new exciting features for accessibility. Closed captioning of the program is available and can be enabled by clicking on the closed caption option on the bar towards the bottom of your screen. This program is also being broadcasted in English and Portuguese, courtesy of Hani Souza. To select your preferred language, please click on the, bot the button that says interpretation below. It is important that you select that appropriate language so that you do not miss any of the conversation. You should either select English or Portuguese and be sure the option is not set to off. We'll get started in just a few moments. We're just waiting for a few more people to sign on. Uh, thank you so much for your patience. Today, ProPublica video journalist Nadia Sussman and Seattle Times reporter Lulu Ramadan will moderate a conversation with experts from Brazil and Florida about alternative approaches to harvesting and what those might mean for the glades where more than half of America's cane sugar is produced. And it looks like we have enough folks on now, so let's go ahead and get started. Again, if you're just joining, my name is Rocio Ortega and I'm ProPublica's events associate. Welcome to today's session, how one country sought to combat the harm of burning sugarcane. Thanks to McKinsey and Company for their support of today's event. This event is being held in partnership with the Palm Beach Post and WLRN. Today, we'll be testing out a couple new exciting features for accessibility. I'll share some of the notes that I shared at the start of the session. Closed captioning of the program is available and can be enabled by clicking on the closed caption option on the bar towards the bottom of your screen. This program is also being broadcasted in English and Portuguese, courtesy of Hani Souza. To select your preferred language, please click on the button that says interpretation below. It is important that you select that appropriate language so that you don't miss any of the conversation. You should either select English or Portuguese and be sure the option is not set to off. For those new to us, ProPublica is a nonprofit newsroom dedicated to investigative journalism. Last year, reporters at the Palm Beach Post and ProPublica investigated the impact of sugarcane warming in Florida. The harvesting practice helps reduce more than half of America's cane sugar, but it sends smoke and ash into largely low-income communities of color in the state's heartland. In their reporting, the journalists learned that other countries have found ways to harvest their crops without those burns. They traveled to Brazil, the world's largest producer of sugarcane, to learn how and why they switched to another method. I'd now like to invite our panelists to join us on screen. Thank you so much for being here today. Dr. Christopher Holmes is an associate professor of meteorology at Florida State University. His research examines the global cycles of air pollutants and greenhouse gases and the interactions of both with climate change. Antonio Queiroz is a technical advisor in the presidency of State of Sao Paulo Environmental Agency. His work includes analyzing environmental licenses and permits, as well as developing policies and procedures on pollution prevention and control permits. Dr. Elena Ribeiro is a professor of environmental health at University of Sao Paulo. Uh, her work focuses on the subjects of environmental health, health geography, and air pollution. Dr. Rafaela Joseto is a scientific researcher at Agronomic Institute of Campinas. She did a postdoctorate at the University of Florida in Belgrade, where she worked with crop options for bioenergy. Her work focuses on soil fertility and fertilization, as well as use of waste in the cultivation of sugarcane. Our moderators today are ProPublica video journalist Nadia Sussman and Seattle Times reporter Lulu Ramadan. As an additional note, this session is being recorded, and a link to the video will be emailed to everyone who registered. Thank you all so much again for being here today, and I hope you enjoy the conversation. I'll let Nadia and Lulu take it from here. Thank you so much, Rocio. We are so pleased to welcome this panel of experts, including two that you saw in the video. And we wanted to start off by talking a bit about what happened in Brazil. Health concerns were one of the factors that led lawmakers to phase out the practice of burning before harvesting. 
So this first question is for Dr. Elena Hibero. Um, I think your camera is still turned off. Dr. Elena, uh, you, it you said know. here I cannot start my video because you close at me. Ah, well, let's see if we can work this out. Oh, there you are. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Elena. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so, Dr. Elena Hibero, you studied the health effects of sugarcane burning in several cities in Sao Paulo State. What were your major findings, especially with regard to disease, hospitalizations, and mortality? Well, I had started studying air pollution effects on health in the city of Sao Paulo in the late 80s. But then around uh, 2000, the year 2000, I started to study the effects of biomass fire, especially because of the uh, great expansion of sugarcane plantation in the state of Sao Paulo due to the development of the flex fuel engine for cars. Uh, at that time, mainly small cities had this problem of uh, receiving the effects of the burning of sugar cane. Uh, uh, and uh, so we selected some municipalities in the state of Sao Paulo. The first one was in Espirito Santo do Turvo in the west part of the state. And we studied mainly direct effects because sugar cane burning can have also indirect health effects as climate change uh, caused by green green greenhouse gases and um, car accidents due to the reduced visibility. But our studies focus uh, on direct effects and uh, mainly respiratory diseases. Uh, uh, I also uh, advised around eight dissertations and theses on the team, on uh, this team of, and I had two large projects financed by the Ministry of Health of Brazil and Ministry of Science and Education. The first one was undertaken in 2004 and 2005 in a municipality where 100% of sugarcane plantations were still burned in spite of the law in 2002 because the plantations were not adapted to receive the machinery. Uh, at that time, we, may, we installed uh, air pollution monitoring equipment at the school, at the city school, and we studied uh, air pollution during hazard harvest time and non-harvest time, and we also studied respiratory symptoms in children from 10 to 13 years old. And our findings indicated that in spite of the, the level of pollutants, uh, they were not over what uh, Brazilian legislation allowed at that time. Now Brazilian legislation is more strict, but at that time it was permitted. Uh, the prevalence of respiratory symptoms in children was very high. Among 28 symptoms that we studied, 22 of them were higher than we had found in this metropolitan regions of Sao Paulo. Uh, and those symptoms were mainly cough most days, cough without cold, wheezing, bronchitis, asthma, ear infections, and allergies. Those neighborhoods were usually uh, uh, low-income neighborhoods uh, where population lived in simple houses without uh, much protection for uh, air pollution. And also, uh, Sugarcane harvest occurs in winter, where you have the problem of um, more virus because of the cold that starts, and also uh, temperature inversions, which uh, difficult turns it difficult to dispersion of air pollution. After that first study, we undertook other studies in Araraquara, which is the north part of the state. And we studied children uh, until four years old, from zero to four years old, and old people, uh, 65 years old and older. And we studied using uh, job processing uh, techniques, uh, geographic information systems, 
with data on uh, sugarcane area, uh, number of fires by uh, satellite images or by uh, CETESB data, which registered the fires. Uh, hospital admissions by age and by, uh, by classification of disease, and also the social uh, data on the population affected. And, and we found that in most of the studies, that there was an association with uh, sugarcane fires and respiratory symptoms and hospital admission, higher uh, levels of hospital admission during uh, sugarcane harvest, and especially in, uh, during or a few days after the fires were allowed by CETESB, which allowed agriculture to, to put the fire on sugarcane before harvesting. Uh, uh, the other finding was that uh, the population was affected was mainly low income population, which had more difficulties in getting to uh, basic health system. So they uh, say more days before getting to the hospital and they would get a, a worse health situation. Uh, and the problem was also worse for children and for old people. That were, those were the main findings. But uh, since those projects, they lasted for uh, a while, we could see that after 2008, which was five years after the law, when uh, part of the, the sugarcane plantations could not be burnt anymore. And from then on, there was a reduction in the number of fires in the state of Sao Paulo. And there was also a reduction in uh, the admissions of respiratory, uh, due to respiratory diseases in the population. We could see that year by year, uh, this reduction. So it was important to see uh, how it happened. Uh, I told about Araraquara, but we studied in Presidente Prudente region, and we studied in the Northwest region of the state where, where 25 municipalities had large areas in sugarcane. And in all those areas, we noticed this reduction in fires and reduction in respiratory disease uh, admission in hospitals with using data from SUS, the Brazilian Unified Health System. Uh, we also, uh, at, in Araraquara, we had studied the uh, airborne polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons to see the, the cancer, the risk of cancer due to the pollutants of the sugarcane uh, fires. And we identified that there was a, a tolerable, tolerable, tolerable risk of cancer uh, in the areas uh, where sugarcane was burned. And, but this risk also uh, decreased along the time. The data with the, the, the when we measure pollutants in, in 2002, was higher than in 2010. So uh, in the meantime, uh, the law uh, brought benefits for the population. So, thank you so much. That was very helpful. Similar to what you've just described, Dr. Elena, um, residents in Florida's Glades region have raised concerns about negative health impacts from cane burning. That was the driving factor behind the lawsuit that was referenced in the documentary. And now that lawsuit was recently dropped at the agreement of all parties. Um, and the major sugar companies in the region say that the air is good and meets federal clean air standards. But as we've reported, the EPA is currently considering whether those clean air standards are adequate to protect public health. Uh, now, Dr. Christopher Holmes, thank you for being here. Uh, your research examines the global cycles of air pollutants and greenhouse gases. What kinds of pollution does sugarcane burning produce in Florida, and what are some of the challenges in tracking it? 
<clears throat> my research group has spent some time looking at uh, data collected from surface monitoring sites in South Florida and also from satellites which orbit the Earth and observe South Florida as well as the rest of the world. And uh, the first thing we looked at was uh, respirable uh, particulate matter, which is also called uh, PM 2.5. And uh, this particulate matter can uh, reach deep into the lungs and cause a variety of, of health uh, problems. There are dozens of monitoring stations in Florida because it's well known that PM 2.5 causes disease. And uh, we looked particularly at several sites that were close to the sugarcane fires. And at two sites near the sugarcane fires, we found that the concentrations of this PM 2.5 were higher during the harvest burn season than they were in uh, the rest of the year. And this was unlike any other uh, sites in South Florida, showing that that the concentrations were higher closer to the fires. Uh, this corroborated what other studies have found in the past. Some researchers at Florida International University measured concentrations of uh, PAHs, which uh, Dr. Ribeiro just discussed, and uh, those were uh, characteristic of emissions from burning vegetation, and those were many times higher in the uh, sugarcane burning region than elsewhere in South Florida. It's now established from many other studies that uh, these uh, small particles and PAHs cause quite a few different health impacts. And Dr. Ribeiro listed uh, several of them, uh, but I would emphasize that uh, they are associated with uh, cases of asthma, bronchitis, emphysema, other respiratory infections, heart disease, heart attacks, lung cancer. Obviously this list goes on, um, but also things like um, premature birth uh, of, and uh, low birth weight of, of babies. Um, several of these can be fatal and um, using these past studies in, in other regions uh, that relate the concentrations of particulate matter to uh, mortality and health outcomes, uh, we estimate that there's probably about one to six deaths per year uh, as a result of these sugarcane burning emissions in South Florida. Uh, for the scale of these emissions, I think it's interesting to compare them to something like motor vehicle emissions. From the area of sugarcane that's burned each year, we think there's about 5,000 tons of uh, particulate matter produced in these fires. And that's pretty close to the emissions from all of the motor vehicles across the state of Florida. But the sugarcane fires, of course, unlike the vehicles, are, are tightly concentrated in just one small part of the state surrounding a few different communities. Thank you so much. Um, that was really illuminating. Environmental concerns also played an important role in the decision in Sao Paulo State to transition away from burning and to harvesting raw cane. Nearly all the cane in the state in Sao Paulo is now harvested without burning. So uh, Dr. Rafaela Joseto, what were the agricultural challenges and the benefits of switching to raw cane in Brazil? Can you tell us what that period of learning and adaptation was like? Boa noite a todos. Eu agradeço essa oportunidade de estar neste importante debate. Olha, é, os desafios foram muito grandes. Né? The challenges were high. The first challenge was that we have no machinery to harvest sugar cane, especially the moment the government decided that we had to change things. We have no machinery. For this reason, we have decided to create a timeline and uh, use a 10 year period to help us adapt to the law. And while we were purchasing the machinery, we have learned how to do the work in the new system. First, we just thought that we would no longer hire people and just use the machines. So we, fa we were faced with new solutions and lots of learning. So the first challenge was machinery, and the second was hiring people. 
because we knew that we would no longer hire so many people because the machines were there. Luckily, the sugarcane sector was expanding and we have hired people to do work in other areas with sugarcane expansion. Later on, the next challenge was that sugarcane productivity lowered because raw cane has lower productivity than burnt cane. Later on, we understood that the machine would stamp on the cane or even the machine would cut some part of the plant. So we have improved quality of the ma machinery in the process. Also, we have resorted to GPS and we no longer have the machinery go on top of the sugar cane line. Later on, we had other, ch other challenges linked to pests. The only advantage of burning is that burning kills off pests. And as time goes by, the pests are faced with their uh, natural killers. Basically, we need to be patient. We need to learn and try to equilibrate the system. Also, we have developed some pesticides that we used in the beginning. And nowadays, we are phasing out the use of pesticides. We Currently, we only use pesticides where we have problems with certain pests. Also, we have changed some plants that were harmful to sugarcane. We have developed new techniques to fight those plants. Also, we have changed fertilization because the straw is really nurturing for the soil. We need to be careful when adapting and using new types of fertilizers. We've learned so much over the first 10 years, and I dare say that now the system is still a work in progress. We're still improving our techniques. We're still using new machines. I've told you about the challenges, but now I'll tell you about the benefits. The benefits are we have more protection for the soil. We have better soil humidity now. We have better soil conservation and better physical qualities for the soil, as well as biological life for the soil. A large number of microorganisms have developed because of the straw. And all of this has brought more organic material and more life to the soil. And I can tell you that the biggest advantage is to raise environmental awareness in the sugar industry. I think that in Brazil, there is nobody who thinks that sugarcane burning is the best technique. Nobody agrees with that anymore. Our agron agronomic engineers, they have shown us how good it is to use the new techniques. And whenever we're faced with challenges, they, they help us see that the new method is much better. Thank you. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you. That was really inf informative. Um, so Brazil's sugar companies seem to have embraced that transition to not burning, as you mentioned. Um, throughout the course of our reporting, Florida sugar companies have denied that pre-harvest burns have a significant impact on air quality or public health. Uh, now, prior to this event, ProPublica asked Florida Crystals and U.S. Sugar, the largest sugar producers in the region, for their perspectives on Brazil and alternative harvesting methods. Florida Crystals did not respond, and U.S. Sugar provided a statement, but it did not address our questions. The company said, 
U.S. Sugar proudly stands behind the safety and integrity of its farming and processing practices. In addition, the men and women of U.S. Sugar are also employee owners of our company with jobs that meet the world's highest standards for worker safety, environmental stewardship, sustainability, and technological innovation. Uh, Antonio Queiroz, this question is for you. You work with the state environmental agency in Sao Paulo that regulates agricultural burning. In Brazil, what was the reaction of the industry when regulators first announced that they were going to end sugarcane burning? And how did that change over time? The question is that sugarcane industry was having a lot of claims of the population nearby due to the, all the health problems in this cities, all the problem due to the, the burning of the sugarcane leaves. So it was not a, 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 a new question. Setesby is the state company in charge of control pollution sources. Of course, a big burning is a pollution source. So when Setesby has a question of the justice of the population about a large burning causing very big problems. So the company needs to take action and please do not burn now because we have a very low humidity in air. We have a very low content of humidity below 20%. You cannot burn now. Justice also start actions against these uh, farmers just asking you cannot burn it. You are uh, causing a big health problem. So it was not uh, a new question to these companies. When in 2002, we got a state law uh, just trying to ban the fires. This law was, as Rafaela said, really well done because it gives to the companies time to make these adoptions. We got a, a period of time of 20 years to burn the fire on the places where harvest could be made by machinery. And 30 years where the harvest should be manual due to the inflammation of the, the land. So companies start to burn the fire. In the beginning, it was a big mess because we were working on paper. Just try to imagine large companies bringing maps in paper saying here is the 20% of my area that I'm not going to burn this year. It was almost impossible to, to monitorize, to give, to communicate. And the company developed a, a way to make everything by the internet in a, 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 a system that we got all the maps of the, the, the farms and the farmer just put, this is the area, the 20% of the area that I am not going to burn in these five first years of the law. So what happened was that when the companies start having this machinery, they start improving this uh, mechanical harvesting and just talk with the environmental agency and talk, hey, we are expected to end this burning in uh, 2020. Let's see, what if I just make it earlier? So the, the companies just talk with the agency and we got an environmental protocol to anticipate the end of burning because when they start to buy this, this machinery, when they start just you need you need to to make big change in the way you plant if you are going to use machinery harvesting you cannot have level curves you need to make everything flat so the machinery machinery can pass through the cane just making the harvest the better way so why do not accelerate this process and also these companies just uh and the problem that they had with the municipalities nearby and the population always claiming about the fires and the burning, especially in the dry season in Brazil, that is our winter. So uh, the sugarcane sector did not uh, try not to, to, 
to ban the files. They just had to have their time to make this adaptation. And it was really a success. Meanwhile, in one of the regions of the state in Jaou, there was a, a action, a judicial action, and it went to the Supreme Court of Brazil that uh, said that it was forbidden to burn in all that region, right? But a, a lot uh, before the, the date that uh, the law stipulated. So it was very important for the sector to say, hey, wait a little, I am doing my job. I am banning gradually and I'm making it in a, in a way that I can maintain my economic activity and we will have the same results in 2017. It was the, the, the last year that we got big fires and the bigger farms. Today we have only very, very, very little burning in the, the properties where it's impossible to make the mechanical harvest. So it was a process, it was not very hard, it uh, took a lot of work, but it is done. Yeah, well, yes, you mentioned a lot of work and um, in the United States, similarly, we often have conversations about that balance between regulation and the economy. Um, and in Florida, many people are concerned about the economic impact of making that harvesting transition. How did you as a state regulator evaluate that dynamic in Brazil, balancing health and safety with jobs? Let's see it in two ways, in two different ways. Well, you have an industry and then you buy a very, very new machinery and you need to dismiss 200 employees. Oh. I'm so sad, but I unfortunately you lose your job. All right? What's the problem? No. Okay? Why? Because I just need to have my profit. Okay, it's a way to see it. If I say to you, well, now you have a new regulation, I need you to have a better pollution, air pollution control, and you say, whoa, but I will need to, 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 to spend a lot of money to do it. Yes but it's for the health of everybody. So I'd like to understand why one can just dismiss people in name of a better profit, and one cannot have a less profit in behalf of all the population. And it's not a new problem. You see, here in Brazil, we have a licensing process that has a previous license, an installation license, and an operation license. So the first one says, well, what you want to do is possible in this place. The second one says, well, you can build your factory, you can build your plant. And the third one, well, start operating. But you need to renew your operation license in three, five years or two years. It depends upon how dangerous is your, your activity for the environment. Well, here in Brazil, there is no such a thing like a acquired right to pollute. Because when you came to renew your, li your operation licensing, I can say to you, well, you know, your uh, air pollution controls are not so good. In this last three years, we have another technology much better, and I want you to improve your, your control, your, pollu your air pollution control. So the renew of the operation license can ask for the, 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 the industry to buy different operations, to buy new equipments and to attend to a, a strict standards. Because in Brazilian constitution, they, it's granted to all Brazilians the right to a healthy environment. So I need to grant it. That's my, my, that's my, my duty as a, a, a government agency and health is one of the most important things that we must look when we are licensing an activity. So, of course, in some activities, you will have some sound pollution, some water pollution, some air pollution, but you cannot compare any pollution from an industrial activity to a burning of hundreds and hundreds of thousands of acres of sugarcane in the free space. So for us, 
it's really a question of a health environmental event. Thank you so much, Antonio Queiroz. In Florida, uh, the agency, so somewhat analogous to the agency that you work for, but in Florida, the agency that regulates sugar harvesting practices is the State Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. We invited Florida's Agricultural Commissioner, Nikki Freed, and her staff to participate in the panel today. They declined saying they were short staffed in the middle of a legislative session. In the past, Commissioner Freed has says she believes it's possible for quote unquote green harvesting or the harvesting of raw unburnt sugarcane to be feasible in Florida, but they still need to examine quote uh, pest and plant diseases, worker safety, Florida's ecosystem and soil composition and industrial demand for green harvesting. Dr. Rafaela Joseto, you spent a year working in Florida's Glades region, and given these concerns, pests, worker safety, the soil, et cetera, do you think a transition to harvesting raw unburnt cane would be possible in Florida? Olha, acredito que sim, porque a Flórida. Eu conheço... I truly believe yes. I know agronomists in Florida. I think they are as good or even better than Brazilian professionals. And if Brazilians have managed to overcome the technical problems, I'm sure American agronomic engineers are also going to make it. I think that you have to start. You don't need to start with 100% of the areas. You could start with 20% of the areas. You could, um, you know, learn from the process. Maybe in five, six years, 10 years, then you overcome the burning and not having problems with pests or infestation. You need to take action now. You need to take action and do work little by little, and you're going to overcome the challenges as they come. And you can learn from us here in Brazil. We know that issues are regionals, but you know, uh, we offer a case study for Florida in any way. I think that it's important to take the first step and then you tackle the problems. The problems are not that hard because the hardest problems are offering people work. And we know that in the US, you have machine harvesting already. So what's the problem of stop burning? Maybe the machinery is going to be slower to do the harvesting. You know, it's going to take some hours more to harvest raw cane than it would with burnt cane. There will be some past, but it's something temporary that you can overcome in some years. Natural, natural enemies are gonna come up, but I think that you have to get started. Florida can lead the way and show people clean techniques and eco-friendly practices. Here in Brazil, one thing that was really good is that the plants are proud of saying they have modern ecologic practices that they do socially responsible work, environmentally right work, and they use this to showcase their success. It's so good that the largest industries, the largest plants in Brazil, they have embraced it and they like to show they protect nature. Thank you so much for that perspective, Dr. Rafaela. That was really insightful. Um, we are coming up on the 20th anniversary of Sao Paulo's original law to phase out the burns. Meanwhile, in the US, we've never had any laws banning sugarcane burning. Lawmakers have taken an interest in air quality, however. 
Last month, three US representatives introduced a bill that would create a pilot program for air monitoring in low income communities and communities of color. Among the sponsors of the bill is Florida Representative Kathy Castor. Um, in Florida's sugar growing region, there is only one government run air monitor. Uh, Dr. Holmes, as an expert in air monitoring and modeling, uh, you've said that the government should take a closer look at the air in Florida's sugar growing region. What should additional government monitoring look like uh, given the short duration of those burns and what might that monitoring tell us? Right, so in urban areas across the US, uh, we have typically an urban area will have uh, multiple monitors and that allows you to map out the concentrations of particulate matter and other pollutants um, in various neighborhoods. Uh, the area of Florida where sugarcane is burned has multiple different communities and uh, the one official monitor there is not in the center of any of those communities. Um, and so I think if you want to know what the concentrations of these pollutants are, obviously you want to have a measurement in, in the center of, of each of the communities or somewhere within the, the general population area. Um, there is a rising availability of low cost sensors, which I know the ProPublica worked on uh, deploying several of those in, in the uh, area. And those are a, a tool that can be used to supplement uh, the regulatory monitors. They aren't as accurate, but they um, are, they are um, or they can be reliable. So uh, they have to be checked carefully, but, but they can be used for mapping things out. And uh, that's being used routinely in, in a variety of other states and, and cities to map out air pollution on fine spatial scales. Um, we also use satellites uh, because satellites are uh, peering down from space all the time. And uh, what we've seen from space uh, re reinforces what we saw from just the, the couple of monitors that are in the, in the area where sugarcane is burned. Uh, the thing that I mentioned earlier was that the concentrations of particulate matter are higher at the two sites that are uh, near the sugarcane fires and the satellites uh, further showed that the area of that elevated particulate matter coincides very closely with the boundaries of the sugarcane fields. So the satellites are providing spatial information uh, that we can't get from current sensors on the ground, but it really does uh, again support the conclusion that uh, there is a source of particulate matter in the sugarcane burning region. Thank you so much for that. Um, Nadia and Lulu for beginning to take us through that discussion. Um, we're now going to turn it over to our audience Q&A, but before doing that, I'd like to just share a quick link to our event survey in the chat box that I am dropping in now. We really appreciate your feedback. Again, if you'd like to ask a question, click that Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen to submit it to us. Um, we already have a few in, so I'm gonna go ahead and pass it back to Nadia to deliver that first question. Thank you so much to all of our panelists. Thank you, Rocio. And thanks to everybody who asked questions. Um, so I'm going to start with one. It's a bit of a double question. Is the reluctance of the Florida sugar industry to invest in machinery, thus costing them money, a part of the problem? And did the price of Brazil's sugar increase after the burn stopped? And so for the first question about the machinery, I just want to say that Florida's sugar is already harvested by machines. So in Brazil, you saw the manual cutters in the video. That practice has been replaced by machine cutting in Florida already. Um, Antonio Queiroz, maybe you can answer the question about the price of Brazil's sugar and if it went up after the burn stopped. I, I don't know if, if you have a, a rise in the price with the stop of the burnings, but the truth is that the industry, a sugarcane industry in Brazil, look forward a green protocol just to be able to sell 
to markets where these uh, worries with environmental subjects were really important just to close, uh, just to, to open markets and not to close them. So when we talk about the green protocol that industry just signed with the environmental uh, departments of Sao Paulo State, this brought a, a very a very good marketing for these companies. So these companies could say, I am a green company. I have my sugar without burning. I have my sugar in a very, very strict law observance. So that was the, uh, the improvement in the to the company profile. I don't know exactly about uh, the, the comportment of the, the prices, but I, I, I heard it of many of these big planters that they say, no, I want to have a green seal on my sugar because Europe wants it, because all the markets want it. I want to be a green product. And it's a good way. Thank you. And thank you to all of the attendees for the excellent questions. Um, we got one here for you, Dr. Holmes. Um, uh, the attendee asks, uh, any time that health outcomes and the relationship between burning and negative health, uh, health outcomes are mentioned, uh, they're told that the data does not support a negative health outcome. You mentioned this when you were speaking earlier. Can you speak a little bit more about that link between mortality and morbidity and burning cycles? Hi. We know from lots of studies in urban areas um, across, especially in the US, but also in Europe and, and many other countries that um, inhaling particulate matter is uh, harmful to your health. And um, Dr. Rivero, has done some of those studies and she spoke directly about that. Um, you can think of this as um, analogous to um, uh, smoking cigarettes, uh, which are also sources of um, particles. And um, tobacco is of course a plant. And so there's some, not a, not a tight analogy, but there's some analogy to burning, uh, to uh, inhaling smoke from a cigarette, which is well known to be uh, toxic, and um, inhaling smoke from other burning vegetation, whether that be a wildfire or an agricultural fire. Um, and so we know that the injuries that come from that depend on how much of that smoke you burn. Uh, we have now established, or the scientific community has now established that, that the, there are harmful effects of burning, uh, excuse me, of inhaling Particle, particulate matter down to very low concentrations, at least concentrations of um, five uh, micrograms per cubic meter. And uh, I, I bring up that specific number because uh, the, the way that air quality is generally regulated in the US is based on a threshold system called the National Ambient Air Quality Standards. And um, that's set by the US EPA and they pick a threshold above which uh, there are consequences and below which um, there, there are not. And there's a lot of um, factors that go into setting those standards, but the current standard is that um, the air quality should have uh, concentrations of 12 micrograms per cubic meter or less of PM 2.5. So, uh, the scientific literature shows that there are harmful effects of inhaling particulate matter at concentrations that are below what the ambient air quality standards allow. So uh, when I have said that, you know, we expect that there are uh, impacts of inhaling smoke from sugarcane and from other uh, burning sources, uh, even though the concentrations in uh, the uh, sugarcane burning region are indeed below 12 micrograms per cubic meter, but we still do expect, expect that there are going to be um, uh, health impacts from those. Thank you. And, and just to throw that question to Dr. Hibero as well, um, you mentioned that that threshold for what's healthy and what's allowed under the law in Brazil also changed over the course of the discussions. So what does that look like? What did that transition look like when um, research and new information emerged in Brazil? Well, Brazil now is in the process of adopting 
World Health Organization threshold, which is lower, a little lower than the American EPA standards. And, uh, but we, we have a time like we did for the sugarcane harvesting in, in using fire. We have a period of adaptation for the cities especially and uh, for uh, car engines to adapt uh, to the new standards. The state of Sao Paulo has a, a progressive uh, process with intermediate phase, in, in phase, intermediate phase one, two, and three, until we get to the World Health Organization uh, thresholds for controlling air pollution. Uh, but but as I said, it's not only the the pollution at the ground level. It's also the greenhouse gases that the burning produces. And this is not being discussed. At, uh, the forest fires in the Amazon are so much discussed and around the world. And uh, and why uh, a volunteer fire like that is not discussed because it produces methane, uh, CO2, uh, CO, and ozone, uh, which are greenhouse gases, and this may affect uh, climate and increased temperatures around the world. So I, I guess we, we need to have a more encompassing discussion regarding the indirect effects also. Dr. Elena Rivero, thank you so much for that. Um, so, you know, in the short time we have, we probably won't get to the fully encompassing discussion that you're talking about, but it's definitely something we should continue to discuss in the future. Uh, we have a question that I think would be good for Dr. Rafaela Fossetto. Um, have the transformation processes away from burning been published in English and is it available? So what resources are out there based on the experience of Brazilian agronomists, engineers, and others who work in the sugarcane industry about transitioning from using prescribed burns to having a no burning harvest? Yes, most of um, scholar work is written in Portuguese, but we have plenty of material in English too, especially as regards to straw, um, you know, nutrient cycles based on straw, the changes in terms of fertilization, all of those agronomic uh, processes are documented in technical journals. You know, if you Google information, lots of um, scholar work is going to show up for you. We have plenty of scientific material on that. Thank you. Um, there are a couple questions here about employment and some of the repercussions of making that transition in Brazil. Um, perhaps this question is best for you, Antonio Queiroz. Um, what happened? What was the feedback like from those who potentially lost jobs because of that transition? And what did the employment trends look like overall with the sugar industry um, when they made that transition away from burning? As I said, it was a slow transition. So we had something like 15 years né, before the total ban of big fires in Sao Paulo State. And this job of cutting raw uh, the, the, the sugar cane, it was not a good job, right? People came from Northeast Brazil, the poorest region in Brazil, came to Sao Paulo State and to the Southwest just to cut sugar cane and then can go back to Northeast Brazil. This job requires people to stay in a very reclined position and managing this, this, this sharp tool to cut the sugar cane. And it was expected from one person to cut something like eight or 10 tons of can per, per day. Not a good job, not a healthy job. 
So this transition was not of a good job to a no job. It was from a, a, a not so good job, a, a job that only provides you some money. As, uh, as Rafaela said, some of these people were employed in sugarcane industry from this, uh, this, um, this uh, 2002 to 2007. We got a big growth of sugarcane industry in Sao Paulo state. So we got sugarcane uh, going over the west of the state. So some of these people went to these activities and the others were just absorbed by the market, all right? It was the question of do it in a, in a time, to, to give time for people to find jobs. But it's completely different from this situation you have in Florida. You do not have people. You are going to lose no jobs if you stop burning sugar cane. Then you will have only the good part. You will have the agronomical benefits that Rafaela said, and we will, you will not have these health risks that Dr. Elena said. So I, I see no problem in this, in, in this question of jobs for Florida, all right? I would, if you, if you permit me, I, I look at in the chat and I saw a question about uh, somebody asked uh, if uh, there is in our constitution the protection of the health of the people. Yes, it is. We have a very, very large constitution and in his 220, uh, 225 article, we have this protection of environment. If you allow me, I will read it to you. Everyone has the right to an ecological balanced environment. A good for common use by the people and essential to a healthy quality of life, imposing on the public power and the community the duty to defend and preserve it for the present and future generations. So this is a constitutional command, right? Uh, environment is a, a good of common use, and we need to protect and we need to grant a health environment. So Article 225 of our Constitution. Thank you so much, Antonio Queiroz. Um, I saw that there was a question have there been health studies in Florida and how large is the exposed population? So I wanted to ask Dr. Christopher Holmes about that. And then I wanted to follow up afterwards for some of our Brazilian panelists to learn a little bit more about how their studies came about. So let's start with Dr. Holmes, please. So my research group has done some of that and we have um, articles that are uh, in peer review at a journal. So. I, uh, yes, the studies have been done, but they haven't been published yet. Um, so I will be able to share more about that hopefully soon. Um, in terms of the population that's exposed, the most heavily exposed population are the people that live in the, in the cities of Belle Glade and Clewiston and Pahokee. And uh, I believe there are about 40,000 people that altogether live in those communities. Um, the smoke, however, is not confined to those uh, communities, and it does drift both east and, and west. And so um, we do expect that even though the concentrations of smoke are low over the coastal cities and uh, further to the west into uh, Glades and Hendry County, we do expect that there would be some health impacts in those regions. And um, I noticed reading through the questions that, you know, some uh, people are interested in having more specific details. And um, I, I expect that within the next uh, few weeks, I would be able to share some figures that, that would address some of those uh, questions that I'm noticing in the chat. Thank you so much, Dr. Holmes. And Dr. Helena Hibero, you mentioned this a little bit, but um, you did a number of studies related to sugarcane burning and health effects specifically. And I think you had mentioned that some you uh, had done in partnership with or funded by government agencies. So I just wanted to ask at the state level or the federal level, um, to what extent is this something that government 
is uh, trying to pursue as a research matter in Brazil? Well, uh, I had mainly uh, funding from federal agencies, like uh, the, the Ministry of Health has a, a health surveillance secretary, which it has a, a secretary, it's called Vigiar, the air surveillance. And in this program, uh, it, had, it opened bids for studies regarding air quality. And I enter in one of those bids for financing part of the study. Uh, other parts of the study are, were financed by CNPq, which is the research Brazilian Institute, which belongs to the Ministry of uh, Technology of Brazil. And some of the, the students, the PhD or master's students, they got financing from the Ministry of Education, CAPES, or from FAPESP, which is the state agency. But during this time, we had partnership with CETESB sometimes, which allowed, gave us the data, or with even the, the sugar industry, which allowed us to put monitoring equipment in, in, in the sugarcane plantations. And uh, we had all the freedom to publish the results. Uh, and one thing I wanted to mention is regarding the labor. We had one of our research, we interviewed lay, uh, workers from the sugarcane plantation because there are many small towns in, in the state of Sao Paulo that have uh, like a rural population that work in sugarcane plantations. And, and we, we did study in one of these uh, villages and we interviewed them. And, and they were at the same time relieved that the, the uh, uh, manual harvesting was finishing because that was a very stressful labor. But they were anxious about finding new jobs. And, and what we, we found was that the unions of sugarcane uh, growers uh, uh, provided courses for them at night on, on weekends, they could uh, learn uh, uh, to use computers or they could learn agriculture practice. So they were prepared for other jobs when uh, they are expecting to lose their jobs. And many of them got employed, as Antonio said, in sugarcane plantations in other parts of the state for uh, planting sugarcane, or uh, they went to soybean plantations or to work in uh, tree planting, you know, reforestation areas in the state of Sao Paulo. And those who came from the Northeast of Brazil, I guess they stayed there because uh, tourism was developed during those years also in the Northeast. So it was easier to find jobs in the Northeast area of the country. So we don't see in the, the cities of the state of Sao Paulo, a process of uh, impoverishment because of lack of jobs, uh, of uh, formation of favelas or things like that. On the contrary, we, we see that there is a increased dynamism in those cities middle-sized cities that have sugarcane uh, meals around them. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, so we have one last question. We'll try to keep it brief if you can, um, but several questions have been posed that mention the um, political uh, donations and sort of uh, the power of the sugar industry and their opposition to uh, shifting away from burning. And um, perhaps Antonio, you can speak to this, but was there a large scale um, resistance to cane burning being phased out in Brazil? And how did you counteract any difficulties that you did that you were confronted with? And if you could keep that short, we're, we're closing out here, but. There was no such resistance, just no resistance at all. Because industry had time to do it. It was something that everybody knows it should have an end. Everybody was seeing the problem. 
you you cannot have an idea of the area with sugarcane in uh, Sao Paulo state. We're talking about a large, a really large area. So when you were traveling in the countryside in June or May, it was possible for you to just drive in a cloud of smoke in the road. It was a big problem. A apart this, everywhere you went in the countryside, you could see the ashes in the house, in the swimming pools, in the gardens, in the whole city. And everybody could think, well, these ashes that are in the ground, maybe part of them are in my lungs too. It was so obvious that this was not a good thing to be done, that there was no opposition. The question was other. How do you make a good monitoring on it? How can I prove that this sugarcane that burned was not burned by my fault? Someone just threw a cigarette from the car and it started burning. And you see, this is a, a sugarcane planted in a place able to receive the harvest, the mechanical harvest. For me, it's not good that it burns now. I do not have equipment to wash these uh, this stalks before milling them. So this was th th these were the big problems. The, the planters said, well, you are charging me with a penalty because I, I, I burned in a place that I was not uh, authorized to burn, but it was not me. I could say this was the biggest problem. So we started a, a question of this, this, uh, this fact, my sugar cane burnt, but it was not me. That was the biggest problem we have. Also, we got some problems as to how each one give us to the agency, the places, well, here is my 20%, I will not burn. Here are my 30%, here are my 50%. How we make it in the maps, it was, uh, a little hard to do, but it, it it went. But never we had an opposition. I want to to continue burning. We have no judicial claim. I want to to burn because I I have the right to burn. It was almost impossible for one to win uh, a civil action with this. But we have no we had no. So we got no opposition. It was a. Uh, a case of success. Uh, all of this is, I believe, Sao Paulo State must, must be very proud. Uh, so the agency, as the the, the sugarcane sector, that we do the right thing. It, uh, all this. What a note to end on. That is our time for today, and I want to thank our panelists. We are so honored by your president by your presence, such incredible insight, just some knowledge that you've shared here today. Um, and of course, our moderators, Nadia Sussman and Lulu Ramadan, thank you so much for navigating us through this complex uh, discussion. Um, I'd like to give a special thank you to McKinsey and Company for its support of today's event. And of course, to our partners, the Palm Beach Post and WLRN. Thank you to our audience for joining us and all of your thoughtful questions that you've submitted today. Again, this event has been recorded, so you'll receive an email with the full video of today's events. We'll also be posting the recording on the ProPublica YouTube channel. And from all of us at ProPublica, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Have a great rest of your night, and we hope to see you at our next event. Thank you. Take care, everyone.